Uh, welcome to this um, this uh, webinar. My name is David Bogle. I'm um, a former scientific vice president of the European Federation Chemical Engineers and still um, on the board. Um, I'm a professor of chemical engineering at, at University College London. Uh, let me just first say something about the webinar series in case you haven't uh, been involved. Uh, we've been for the last four years uh, organizing uh, a series of webinars of such as this, uh, and it came about during the COVID period to try and keep the, um, the, the, the community together a bit more, but we've continued because they proved to be very successful and very uh, flexible and indeed inclusive. Uh, nine of our working parties and sections are, have um, webinars during this series over this two weeks, I think it is. Um, I won't go through them, but uh, uh, the series, obviously it's for specialists, but it also enables our um, members of the chemical engineering community around Europe to, to uh, sample matters in areas that they might find interesting, but you know may not otherwise have had the opportunity to attend before. So we can um, encourage a bit of cross-fertilization between areas. So the bit about the European Federation, it uh, promotes scientific collaboration and supports the work of chemical engineers in 30 European countries, representing more than 100,000 of them across Europe. And the Working parties and sections cover all major aspects of chemical engineering and are right at the core of the, the organization. They, they, they provide an important forum for technical exchange and networking amongst chemical engineers in Europe and indeed beyond. And I'm particularly happy that in this series, uh, we will have um, uh, uh, spotlight talks from two, the two newest sections of the EFC, the chemical engineering as applied to medicine and uh, early career uh, chemical engineers. So just before I conclude, I just want to thank all the members of, in the working parties and sections that have worked so hard to for this uh, initiative to happen. And I'd particularly like to thank Martine Fu, who's uh, from um, Toulouse, who uh, came up with the concept, but has done so much of the practical activities to support uh, these, these activities. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll keeping the speakers to time. And I uh, wish to all the speakers and everybody a fruitful and uh, successful uh, webinar. So let me hand over to Michael Schluter, who's the chair of the working party on multiphase fluid flow from the uh, Technical University in Hamburg. Yeah, thanks, Mitt. Thanks a lot, uh, David, for this introduction. And also from me, uh, my side, thanks a lot to Martin for organizing uh, this and to, to give us a possibility from our working party to have the spotlight talk uh, today. So uh, I'm Michael Schlüter, head of the Institute of Migrating Phase uh, Flows at the Hamburg University of Technology. And uh, uh, together with my co-chair, uh, Alexandra von Kamicke, uh, we are very happy that we have so many participants today interested uh, in our uh, topic. Yeah, and before I uh, give you a brief introduction into our topic, I would like to give you some, some information how to use this uh, uh, today. Uh, we have a Q&A, F&A button at the bottom, and uh, uh, with this button, uh, you can ask questions after the presentations, and this is also possible uh, after the presentation ends, yeah, so the questions will be continuously um, answered, so please use the Q&A button, and uh, further on, I would like to uh, mention that these lectures will be recorded, and uh, they will be visible on YouTube um, afterwards, so you can also uh, look on the videos and please uh, make also advertisement for our uh, spotlight talk uh, afterwards after we finished and now i hope uh, that we will have uh, interesting uh, presentations and uh, discussion afterwards so um what is the idea of uh, the today's spotlight talk series so the the idea is uh, that uh, we all know that efficient mixing mass transfer and the subsequent uh, chemical or biochemical reactions in multi-phase flows are the key to uh, high quality and sustainable products. And uh, the understanding of um, and the optimization is uh, very uh, important and a big uh, opportunity for us to face climate change um, at the end. And uh, this is a very important topic, but uh, despite this fact, uh, so far, if we think about uh, reactions in chemistry or biotechnology, we mostly think on uh, idle mixed systems. Sometimes we think about plug flow. Eventually, more and more, we think about compartments that are uh, coming up, that we have a series of uh, well-mixed systems and plug flow systems. But as soon as this compartment thinking comes up and uh, compartment modeling, it gets more and more interesting 
of what, what is the residence time of certain cells or reactants or uh, heterogeneous catalysts in these kind of compartments and how is uh, the interplay between the different compartments and the uh, the diffusion for example across the uh, compartment uh, structures and this is a very important uh, point and uh, probably a kind of uh, paradigm shift in thinking about uh, flows react and reactions in uh, multi-phase flows and that's what we would like to address today. So how does a cell feel if it goes through a reactor and uh, it is exposed to different uh, pHs, uh, oxygen concentrations, temperature, shear stress, whatever? This is a big question. And uh, how relevant is this question? And uh, do we have already tools available to answer this question? This is the topic of today's Spotlight Talk. And I hope that with our wonderful presenters today, and uh, the discussion afterwards, we can uh, shed some light uh, on this uh, on this area and can can see that. So I'm very honored uh, and pleased uh, today that we have been able to attract our speakers from Switzerland, France, uh, and Germany, from academia as well as industry, and uh, they will give us uh, important insights uh, into the topic and help us in the following uh, discussion. And uh, we will start on the uh, theoretical background uh, with uh, the presentation of uh, George Haller, head of the group of nonlinear dynamics at the ETH in uh, Zurich. And uh, he's a kind of uh, yeah, godfather of uh, Lagrangian current structures, I guess, of the analysis. And uh, yeah, this will be a very good uh, theoretical background for us. Afterwards, we will follow up with a presentation from Alexandra von Kameke. Uh, she's at the University of Applied Science in Hamburg and will bring us from the theoretical point of view more to the applications and engineering applications. And uh, then we uh, will have the talk from Veronique Roig. She's head of the Institute of Mechanics de Fluids in Toulouse. And uh, she will show us further exciting insights uh, into, uh, into uh, compartment modeling and uh, experimental opportunities and she will more emphasize also on the importance of these uh, Lagrangian uh, view on the uh, reactions and uh, multi-phase flows. And then last but not least, we are extremely happy that uh, Anna Hoffmann uh, is with us, head of the fluid particle and reaction modeling uh, group at the BSF company in Ludwigshafen. And uh, Anna Hoffmann will us, 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 give us uh, interesting insights uh, into the actual state of research and industry and uh, further demands and uh, optimization uh, possibilities uh, in industry. So with all that, we have a very broad view on this uh, topic, and uh, I'm very excited and uh, uh, yeah, look forward to uh, the presentations and the discussions. But before I start, I would like to hand over uh, to uh, Alexandra von Kameke, uh, who is uh, initiating uh, this kind of research at our university some years ago, and uh, she's inspired us to this uh, spotlight talk. Alexandra, please. Yeah, thanks, Mike, Michael, for um, your introduction. And I'm really, really glad and thankful to have the opportunity to discuss these issues that you just mentioned with you all and um, yeah, to this audience and this committee. And uh, I think it's, uh, for me, I think it's really important that um, there has been so much disruptive development development in my view on uh, three different sides. Um, first of all, there has been disruptive development um, on particle tracking velocimetry, which has a technique that has really matured in the last years. And second, there has been so much development in the Lagrangian current structures uh, and the methods and analysis possibilities we have to look at these trajectories that we just can measure. And uh, maybe third, and that will be maybe the last talk of today, there has also been so much um, development in numerical methods. So really, the reactors can now be temporarily resolved, um, yeah, modulated. Uh, so it's kind of um, the digital twins get, get close to reality. And um, yeah, and the first uh, two um, uh, issues, so the 4D PTV and the LCS mixing, I will also elaborate more in my talk, but um, yeah, first of all, as uh, Michael has already mentioned, we get to know a little bit more about the Lagrangian current structures and their analysis and how this picture maybe deviates from what 
usually one is learning in <laughs> fluid mechanics class. <laughs> so I had a hard time to teach the chemical engineers that <laughs> a time dependent system has is a different dynamical system than a non time dependent system. But I think we have the um, here the uh, best uh, person to to uh, teach us about this. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to um, hand over now to Professor Haller, who is the head of the group of the nonlinear non dynamics um, uh, group at the ETH in Zurich, and his talk, Recent Developments in LCS Analysis, Diffusive and Active Transport Barrier Detection. And I have to admit that <laughs> I know him already for a while, because um, my husband was a postdoc at his institute. So with this, I would like to hand over. Thanks a lot, Alexandra. It's great to see you again. And uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here to this community, which is not my own. Um, so it's always exciting. So uh, let me just get this out of the way. Um, what is this? Uh, right video. Oh, I'm floating. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, I don't know about teaching you LCS. Um, the uh, I actually thought I would show you some post LCS results almost, but uh, which means that these are not necessarily the the tools or results that one would see in an introductory course in LCS, but these are further developments um, that are more recent. Um, in any case, let me jump right into it. This is a motivational picture that that I find very helpful because it shows the societal importance of understanding mixing. These days, this was a dramatic picture uh, by a professional photographer, Dania Beltra, uh, of the Gulf oil spill, which clearly had important societal implications. Um, I will forget at the end to give further references to what I'm discussing here. So I thought I would mention at the beginning, final th three or four years of work, depending on how you count, uh, a book is out on this that I worked on. It's called Transport Barriers and Coherent Structures, Advective, Diffusive, Stochastic, and Active Methods. It's Cambridge University Press. And what's uh, also special about this book that I have a very talented student, Alex Encinas Bartos, who worked out numerical, um, uh, created a numerical database uh, of Jupyter notebooks with various implementations of coherent structure methods. And these are open source Jupyter Notebooks, they form this package T barrier on GitHub. Here's a link, but you can also get to it from our webpage. And also more importantly, there are YouTube videos that explain and demonstrate how to use each and every one of these notebooks. And one, if one has the electronic version of the blog book, then one can simply click on links and they work on a good day. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of give you a quick um, uh, introduction to transport barriers. So a lot of the studies that you're familiar with and I familiar with talk about transport barriers and uh, very freely. Um, and we also all sort of all have an intuition for what that might mean, but we rarely define them. And that might just mean like a seem like a mathematical exercise, but once you actually start defining them, you at least I, I you realize that you don't know quite what they are and there's always a benefit to figuring out what they are. And that then in turn leads to detection methods and analysis. What we, I would say, understand fairly well by now is advective barriers to transport. And those go by the name of Lagrangian co coherent structures. Um, they um, they um, can be defined in many different ways. And uh, perhaps we hear more about that in, in the upcoming talks. But I would say without going into their definitions that they are form templates or they form uh, distinguished material surfaces such that if you understand where they are and how they are moving in a general flow, then you are able to characterize uh, the large-scale transport, understand what mixes with what and what goes where. And I wrote a review article about this in 2015. Um, when you do anything in, in advective mixing, then there will be always people in the audience from the fluids community who who will point out that that's interesting, but what we really care about is the matter of diffusive mixing, which means that you no longer are interested in where, where fluid particles are going, but you're also interested in where, or perhaps even more interested in where diffusive and how diffusive tracers mix in the flow. Uh, that's a fairly recent development in addition to the Lagrangian toolkit, LCS toolkit, and these are papers that came out in 2020. 
And even more recently, uh, once you solve that problem, the people will say, yeah, that's you know interesting, but what's really interesting is not that, but we're interested in active transport, which is the transport of vorticity, momentum, and so on. And there are some very influential papers that have found uh, layers, for instance, on the, the of um, in turbulence. For, these are called, for instance, uniform momentum zones that are characterized by, by different transport properties for active quantities, such as momentum. So that took us a while to figure out how to deal with defining barriers there, and I'm listing the papers here. So what took us a while to address two and three, we wanted to have the same mathematical rigor that we had in LCS theory, and perhaps equally importantly, we wanted these the, the mathematical rigor to be directed at observable structures, things that you would actually have a chance to verify experimentally. And experimental verification still means that you will be putting something in the flow and you will be observing how that moves. So fundamentally, uh, what by experimental verification, I mean that it has to be material, uh, the verification method, particles or passive scalars and so on. And then once you do that, you would like to have criteria that give you observer independent results because the fundamental axiom of continuum mechanics where I come from in terms of my upbringing is that material response should be independent of the observer. And in fluid mechanics, for some reason, this is st still sometimes not understood or debated, but in theoretical physics, and especially in continuum mechanics, this, this is a done deal. This, was, this has been settled for a long time, a long time ago. And uh, if you come up with something that you claim to be about material behavior, and yet your criterion for it depends on the observer, then people would uh, not be interested in hearing that. So the theory must be objective, we say. It should be framing different. It doesn't matter whether the observer rotates or moves. If you claim that something is a transport barrier and you feel it's intrinsic to the fluid, then different observers should give back the same result. And su surprisingly or unsurprisingly, pretty much most of what's used in fluid mechanics does not have this property, uh, except for anything in the area of lagrange current structures, because that was motivated by dynamical systems, continuum mechanics. So whatever I want to do in two and three, I want to describe it in an objective fashion. So first, let's talk about diffusion. Um, if you see um, mixing in a lab, then there will be a difference between highly uh, diffusive and and not so diffusive settings. Um, this is an advection diffusion problem. Two different kinds of dye were injected just a few drops into each of these uh, glasses here. And uh, what you see here is the result. So there will be, uh, in the case, you have a high Peclet number uh, situation, which means actually the advective transport rate dominates the diffusive rate, which means weakly diffusive situation. Then even after some time has elapsed, you clearly see barriers to diffusive transport. At the same time for low Peclet numbers, which means diffusive is substantial, diffusivity is substantial, you don't see such barriers anymore. So the question would be, what are these barriers? Why don't we see mixing across these, what, what appear to be material surfaces? What are they and how do we find them? Um, mathematical terms, in mathematical terms, we would need to find transport barriers under small diffusion within this advection diffusion equation, where C is the passive scalar we are interested in, V is the velocity field, kappa is some sort of molecular diffusivity, and the Peclet number is supposed to be large. So this is what you would see in the lab. There's a related problem that you would see in nature. Uh, what you see here is a global float map that NASA has compiled. And these were released and recorded at different times. What they did, they shifted the initial conditions to the same locations as if they had been released at the same time instant. And they did this animation, which is really interesting to see. Okay, So in real life, these were released at different times. When you shift them together, these interesting structures emerge. Namely, by and large, the motion is, seems stochastic, but there are barriers that emerge here, right? So if I run, if I wait for this to run till the end, uh, then I think I'll, I'll see the barriers. So for instance, there's clearly something there. There's barriers at other locations. So what would those be? How do I define them, especially in an objective fashion? How do I detect them from data? Uh, this, this is then problem number two. In this case, we would think of this uh, uh, um, visibly as a more of a stochastic motion with a deterministic drift and some Brownian motion perturbation to multiple Brownian motions. And um, the reason why uh, it's actually very similar to the lab problem that I showed you is that the PDF of, of this problem, um, probably the density function is known to satisfy uh, this Fokker-Planck equation, which looks very much 
like the, the advection diffusion equation that I showed you before. So this is the probability of being at location X at time T, assuming that you started from X up not and T not. And this is a scalar PDE. There are some minor differences, but you can transform one to the other. Um, so th for that reason, if you solve the first problem, actually you have already solved the second problem as well. So from a mathematical standpoint, diffusive and stochastic transport are the same. But how do you set up this problem? Uh, so I'm interested in the uh, advection diffusion of this concentration C. It's de described by this equation that I showed you before. I can pose it in n dimensions, so the spatial variable can be n-dimensional. And I can also throw in terms that I didn't have initially, some spontaneous exponential decay, which sometimes uh, people have here for uh, spontaneous concentration decay with time. Uh, you could have that for the oil as well, and you could have sources and sinks here as well. Uh, the D is a diffusivity tensor, which physically has to be symmetric and positive definite. Kappa is assumed to be small, okay? And I'll be looking at the simplest case when these two terms are out. But first, I want to define what I'm after. I'm after some material surface that visibly acts as a barrier to diffusion here or even there. This is also a float picture, and there's an amazing, mysterious barrier here that the float near the coast of Florida that these, these floats, ocean flows, don't, do not cross historically. So these are the types of surfaces that I imagine to be built out of fluid particles. So they are material. I want to I wanna know what distinguishes them. And I would like to be able to extract them just from velocity data. That velocity data might be remote sense data or reconstructed from, from PIV or particle traces, OK? And I want to do that without ever simulating the PDE. And I just want to focus on what these mysterious barriers are and not, not in between. I don't want to get lost in the details of diffusive transfer. So I'm looking for material surfaces that have some initial position I'm not, and they are affected by the flow. The flow map is just a mapping that maps initial fluid positions at T naught to their positions at time T. That's something we use in dynamical systems. And that gives you a time evolving material surface. I'm showing that here, okay? And it's very easy to say what I'm after. A material barrier to diffusive transport would be one of these surfaces that inhibits inhibits transport more than its neighbors do. So you could look at all the neighboring surfaces. There's infinitely many. Uh, and you could compare how much transport there is through them, diffusive transport. And you're looking for the one which um, blocks diffusive transport more than any other neighbor. So this actually leads to a, leads to a well-defined, uh, although complicated, um, extremum problem. I just want to talk about the simplest setting when you don't have natural de spontaneous decay and sources and sinks. I just need the expression of C through a general material surface MT over some time interval T0, T1. And that's undisputable. Lucky to be agree on that. It doesn't matter if you're a chemical engineer or a geophysicist or a mechanical engineer, but you would say I need the flux vector, which is on the right-hand side um, of the advection diffusion equation. This is diffusivity a diffusivity tensor and the gradient of C. This is a time evolving material surface. And these are these little vectors sticking out. And what I'm going to do, I take the dot product of that flux vector with the normal of the surface, integrate it over a surface and also integrate in time. So that's the total number of stuff transported through this surface. And unlike classical LCS methods where you would say, oh, I'm interested, I think the important quantity is is stretching. I think the important quantity is rotation or any other thing. This, the advantage of the diffusive setting that there's very little argument that these are, this is what we should all be meaning by diffusive transport through a material surface. Okay. And then you basically, from this point on, it's a calculus of variations problem. You look, this is what we call a functional. It depend, depends on surfaces. And I look for the surface that extremizes this functional. So I look, look, look for the material surface. Ultimately, I only look for its initial position because it's a deterministic flow. Uh, so once I know the initial position of the surface, I can just advect it by the velocity field. So ultimately, this whole thing only depends on the initial position of the surface. And then to, uh, to make things simple, I will just say, you know, I look for the most resilient surface. So I will subject it to the most diffusion prone concentration, which is I will assume that the, the, the gradient of that scalar is precisely normal to this surface, okay? And that I don't care about other aspects of the gradient distribution. It's the negative normal of that surface. Once again, I don't know the surface yet, um, but this is what I assume for the initial concentration. Then I want to non-dimensionalize this problem. Uh, first of all, I want to 
the, the, uh, divide by the time that has elapsed. I want to um, divide by the, the magnitude of the initial concentration because just somebody was closer uh, to higher concentration gradients. I don't want to take that into account because that's not the property of the surface itself that I'm after. after. And I also don't want anybody to, to win this game just because they are large. Um, I, I'm interested in the permeability of the surface. So I also divide by the area. So that ultimately leads to a, a simplified expression. Uh, th there's a tensor here that multiplies the, the normals of the surface and is the normalization. This actually is very hard to prove mathematically. It turns out that what a power you have here because it turns out to be a singular perturbation problem with respect to the diffuser. In any case, uh, there is a functional here and you can take the variation of derivative of that and equate it with zero. So this is, this is the math part. And once you solve that one, you're done. Any surface that extremizes this would be a diffusion barrier. Okay. And it turns out that this that you can write a general solution for it, which is not necessarily terribly useful, but at least theoretically, what these surfaces are, they are null surfaces of a tensor. Uh, this is a, you think of a tensor as locally a three by three or two by two matrix. And if you a null surface is a tensor of a tensor is is um, is a surface that such that if you uh, feed in the normals of that surface from behind and and from up front to this tensor, so you form a quadratic form of this tensor, then you get zero along that surface. So that tensor would vanish on the surface. And this mysterious T tensor is a transport tensor that I explain here, which is the inverse transpose of the flow map gradient, inverse of the flow map gradient, and this diffusivity tensor in between time averaged. So generally speaking, you need to compute this by approximating numerically the flow map, which is not easy. But if you have an understanding of the velocity field uh, for measurements, then you can simply just generate a grid of initial conditions and do that. Uh, otherwise, you may actually, if you're lucky and you have a large density of particle tracks, then you can use directly those to approximate the flow map. You do need to have some understanding of the diffusion, not about its magnitude, but somehow about its structure, which is a diffusivity uh, tensor. In case of pure molecular diffusion, this is just the identity. So you don't need to know anything about uh, but the diffusion, not even its magnitude, as long as it's small. Uh, as long as you can have an idea of the flow map itself, look for this tensor. Now, this seems too abstract, which it is. Uh, so, But in two dimensions, you can translate this, this result. Details are not important. This is, a, this is just a complicated vector field or direction field that you can calculate from data. So if you have the velocity field, you can run trajectories and you can calculate it, this family of curves from data. And this, this will be a parameter here that tells you what that little diffusion strength that you have through the surface will be. And by varying that parameter, uh, you can test the flow for diffusion, surf, um, diffusion barriers of that strength. And these lambdas and these CIs are eigenvalues and eigenvectors of what we call a you know, generalized Cauchy-Green strain tensor, uh, which is something like the original Cauchy-Green strain tensor in conti from continuum mechanics, which is the gradient of the flow map transpose, the gradient of the flow map. But you stick in, in between the diffusivity structure tensor and you multiply by its determinant here. And you also average the whole thing over time. So this comes out rigorously from this analysis. And that's one, this is only valid in 2D. In 3D, there isn't such a simple solution to the previous problem. But when you do a further analysis, you actually get a very useful diagnostic quantity, which is the trace of this tensor. And you can just plot that over initial con con um, configurations. And this will replace what we in, in Lagrangian coherent structures call the finite time Yapudov exponent. That's a classic tool. And then you basically plot instead of the FTLE, you plot the trace of this tensor and it will tell you where the important barriers are. This is one particular example uh, from a, a data set, which is the Agulas ring data set from remote sensing available from satellite altimetry, both the velocity field, so you can generate trajectories as well as the temperature field. And the question would be, what are, this is the temperature field distribution. What are the structures that govern these? What are the material structures? And if you look for, uh, closed orbits of this vector field, then those are here. 
those will be typically limit cycles of this vector field, and those turn out to be huge transport barriers to diffusive mixing now. These are not barriers to advective mixing, but to diffusive mixing. So these are the surfaces that I was looking for in this particular data set. You can view them as diffusive eddy boundaries, and these, this parameter just tells you to what extent they block the diffusion. But they are blocking the diffusion more than their neighbors. Um, you can, in fact, verify that if you make fake copies of them, uh, which Daniel did, my co-author here, and then you just release traject diffusive solutions from them. So the, you track the, how the concentration along trajectories uh, changes. And then he took the real ones and also just shifted uh, some, some of them randomly. So not, not all of these are real barriers. And what he does, he lets the concentration evolve and updates the, the, that location, that initial condition, with the varying concentration in time. So imagine traveling with the flow. That's why you don't, these, these deform vigorously because it's a turbulent flow, but he updates the concentration based on their initial configuration. So immediately see that the fake ones, this, there was a fake one here that he just shifted there, gets completely eaten up by diffusion. But the ones that were obtained from this analysis, which was purely based on advective quantities, no, none of the no diffusions, the simulations that were performed, the PD was not solved. Those are the ones that really hold the particles together. Again, this might be confusing for you. This is not an Eulerian, this is a Lagrangian simulation. These are ad being advective turbulently, and they get, you know, they get roughed up pretty much uh, to a large extent. But this is one way to pull out the diffusive component of that mixing and update. The concentration based on the initial configuration. Again, the ones that the criterion picked out uh, keep their integrity. Um, still have a few moments. So I wanted to move to the to the other question. Was uh, I'm not there's a similar results for for you know stochastic mixing. I um, I'm not going to go into that. But on the same data set, you can imagine that this is how your floats will get in and out stochastically from these rings. I want to talk about a little bit about active transport. I probably have about six minutes left. Um, what, what's the deal with, with understanding the transport of active quantities? Uh, we still don't know how to do it for active scalars, such as just the vorticity magnitude or momentum magnitude, but we have figured out how to do it for active vector fields. So an active vector field is something that derives its value directly from the velocity field. So if it changes, then the velocity field changes as well, unlike passive scalars. Examples of act active vector fields are uh, vort the vorticity or the angular momentum or the linear momentum. Uh, we just assume that we have a general generalized Navier-Stokes non-Newtonian possibly compressible uh, momentum equation. So all the the uh, the material properties are here in this viscous stress tensor. So this is more general than Navier-Stokes. These these are the external forces. Other than that, this is the velocity and this is the pressure. Okay, so we do need a dynamical context. This is not no, no longer purely kinematic. And there will be two assumptions to this theory. One of them is that whatever active vector field whose transport I'm interested in, when I derive an, an evolution equation for it, a PDE, then I can split that uniquely into a viscous part and a non-viscous part. Non-viscous is simply defined by the fact that, you know, using this equation, I get, you know, a general PDE for F. And then the non-viscous part is the one that doesn't depend on the viscous uh, stance, uh, stress tensor. And the only other uh, assumption will be is that the viscous part is objective, namely that uh, if I apply transformations like this, so I rotate the frame and shift the frame, then the then this quantity H transforms what people say transforms pop properly. So you can just multiply. By the transpose of this, it by the, the transpose of the rotation tensor. This is how you would transform things in linear algebra. But this is how you transform vectors. But most quantities don't transform like that in, in fluid mechanics. Vorticity, it's a whole lot more complicated formula. Velocity. So this is not about vorticity or velocity, but it's about the term in the evolution equation for the F that I'm interested in. And this actually is satisfied. For instance, if your quantity of interest is the linear momentum rho times V, then you write out the the evolution equation, again, possibly this is compressible, so you will have a row dot term there. This is the part that will pop up uh, as, um, as HVIS, and that's by definition uh, in continuum mechanics by Cauchy's construct, this is objective. If your main quantity is the vorticity, quantity of interest, 
Then the evolution equation is the vorticity transport equation. And you can clearly define separate one part that depends on the viscosity, the rest doesn't. And the criterion was that it has to be objective, this part. It has to be indifferent to frame changes like that. And again, by construction, this is. So the under this condition, again, one, you might ask, what is the flux of a vector field with respect to the surface? It turns out for various reasons that the commonly used flux notions are inadequate. Uh, people know the notion of vorticity flux in fluid mechanics that doesn't even actually have the right uh, unit for, for a flux. It's sort of a misnomer, misnomer but also it, 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 it's not objective. So it's not a quantity I want to work with. There's also the term momentum flux. Again, these are very well used, uh, very broadly used uh, textbook terms, but it's, a bit more, it's basically a convention that you call them that way. But they don't have the units of flux. If you look at it, it's, it's not what an actual flux should be. Plus, in the case of a material surface, fluid particles actually don't get through a material surface ever. They are either before it or after. They cannot cross a material surface because that would mean they collide with another uh, fluid particle. So again, in, in its name, the momentum flux is a flux, but it's not what you would normally want for you know unit uh, quantity of something passing through a surface, um, a unit area per unit time. That's what would be, the, that's what say heat fluxes or other clearly defined notions of flux. So what do you do? You, you mimic the definition of the fluxes that, that you're familiar with and they, that, which are not just flux in name, but otherwise. So the diffusive flux of F would be the material derivative of F dotted with the surface normal through A's N. And we only take the part of this which, which depends on the viscosities and hence objective. So very clearly, very simply, the F dot, the flux of F will be just F dot, F dot, which is the time derivative of F uh, multiplied by the unit normal. And when you evaluate that from the general evolution equation for F that I wrote out in the previous slide and only keep the objective viscous part, then it's this simple. So whatever you have the objective part in the evolution equation of F, dot it with N dA. And then the question is, is the same, this is okay, even in terms of units and objectivity. And what we wanna do, we, I also normalize it with time. This is flux, so I wanna make it transport, uh, turn it into transport, so I integrate it and then divide it by the time elapsed. And again, it's the same game as before for diffusivity. What are the surfaces, initial surfaces for which this flux is minimal? Those will be the inhibitors of active transport. And then uh, these are the ones that would be barriers. There's notation here. I don't have time to go into that. But when you solve that extremum problem, you can define either material barriers to active transport, or which are longer term, or instantaneous ones. Both of them are objectives. These are they are surfaces, invariant surfaces of these equations or these. The momentum barriers are invariant surfaces for these streamlines, if you will, for these equations, and the vort vorticity barriers are barriers for these equations. And these are steady equations because they either involve just one time, the, the, the evolutionary variable is not time, but it's sort of what we call a barrier time. And um, these are all three-dimensional, two-dimensional equations that you would analyze exactly the same way as if you were looking for LCS, except that you don't do the LCS techniques. You don't apply the LCS advective techniques to the velocity field. But if you look for momentum barriers, you apply them to the Laplacian of the velocity field. If you look for vorticity barriers, then you apply LCS di diagnostic tools that are in the literature, but not to, to the velocity field, but to the Laplacian of the vorticity. These LCS tools, which again, I don't didn't have time to talk about, but these are in the literature. When applied in this context, we call them active LCS diagnostics, ac active FTLE, active um, polar rotation anger and so on. All of those classic LCS tools have active analogs. And instead of applying them to the velocity field, you apply them to the momentum of the vorticity. And I just want to show you that maybe on a 3D channel flow, when you do this, uh, it, it, this would be just a short-term FTLE to the F to apply to this channel flow, which means instant, very short-term advective mixing analysis. And this is what you would get out from one snapshot of the velocity field. If you change the question and you say, I'm actually looking for active barriers to linear momentum, and then depending on what at what scale and what detail you want them, on the same exact snapshot of the velocity field, this is the level of detail that you would get 
for barriers to linear momentum. I'm always amazed by how just by changing the tool of interrogation on this one snapshot, how much more you get out of this. And if you say, I'd like to get the instantaneous soil area barriers, uh, oil area barriers to, to vorticity, then you get even more detail. So compare this picture with the classic LCS approach, advective mixing barriers, and you start applying active criteria, then all of a sudden you get by and large consistency, but you get an amazing level of detail from the same single velocity snapshot. Uh, this is how it would look when you analyze just a, a part of a turbulent channel flow, just using plotting the vorticity, which gives you some level in that snapshot versus plotting uh, the diagnostic that reveals the active barriers. And you see that they coincide, they agree with each other, they don't disagree, but like a whole new world is opening up and details about structures that we never saw before when we just used advective tools. Uh, I just showed this final slide, this is ongoing work with that level OSS group, in which when he saw this, it's a great in Rayleigh Bernard flows, I've always been interested in how advective, diffusive, and active barriers are related to each other, whichever way they define. Hopefully this is now coming up in JFM. I just finally wanted to flash you the, the difference in a flow like this. When you ask different questions, you know, this is an active vortic vorticity barriers, so to speak, uh, advect, sorry, advective uh, barriers, but of elliptical nature, or when you detect them in terms of vorticity barriers uh, or diffusion barriers. So this, in this example, all three were applied and I'm over, I ran out of time. Sorry about yeah. being over time. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Very interesting. So uh, no questions in the chat and anyway, we've run out of time. So let's move straight on to Alexandra from Kamika from the um, University of Applied Sciences in Hamburg. Can we live with Dankwart's dream? Very enticing. Okay, wait a second. I need to um, share. I think it should work now. So can you see my um, presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, first, thank you very much for this um, overview over the last developments. I have to admit, <laughs> we're not there yet. <laughs> we stick to the advective transport barriers for the moment. Um, but I think there is um, a good opportunity that in some of our measurements, we could also switch to the diffusive barriers or um, also the active barriers. And it will be very interesting to use them on, on realistic um, uh, problems from reactors. Um, I think that's, that's something which you definitely should keep on discussing. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had kind of step a bit back and um, we'll talk now about um, some, yeah, let's say developments, which I already triggered a bit before. Um, my title, uh, the title of my talk is Can We Live Dunkworth's Dream? So, <laughs> of course, my husband asked, but does anybody know who Dunkworth is? And I was like, yes, of course, everybody knows who Dunkworth is. But as maybe there are some people in the audience who are not um, uh, chemical engineers by training, I um, have to say that um, uh, his, I think his name was Peter Victor Dunkworth, uh, was maybe one of the most influential early chemical engineers um, and who made up the residence time theory that I will also talk about. Okay, um, so the work I'm presenting is not only done by myself, but also by colleagues. So my former institute, where I used to be a postdoc, Institute of Multiphase Flows, which you already know, Professor Flüter, and also by um, another colleague at the Lofana University in Lüneburg, Professor Pat Bergele, who is also involved in LCS analysis. I will go into details later. And yes, maybe you have seen the title of the talk and you thought, wow, Oh, she's ambitious. <laughs> How can she know what Dunkworth dreamt about? And actually, I, I don't. I know, don't know if he dreamt about what I'm telling you. But um, I, I'm able to read, and he wrote some things. And he said um, that uh, when he was, uh, yeah, on the final, um, on the final sentences of his um, important paper on residence time theory, he said um, that this treatment will be only suddenly applicable to real reactors, it's just a rough guide, because the chance of a molecule reacting depends on its path through the reactor. And he's also said, a chance of a given molecule reacting depends on the molecule's 
which it encounters on its passage. Um, <clears throat> so I found this very, very interesting. I tell you in a second why. Also Levenspiel, 10 years later in his um, early book and, and famous book about residence time theory, he said, um, for the exact behavior of a vessel as a chemical reactor, we must know what's happening inside it. And there's only one way, we need to tag and follow each and every molecule. Um, however, he says that's an impractical use uh, to approach. Uh, we don't have the experimental tools for it. We cannot do it. Well, um, as I already told you, I'm not a chemical engineer by training. I'm a physicist. And when I read this, yeah, during my postdoc, so quite late, <laughs> um, I was immediately thinking, wait a minute, maybe that's not so impossible, right? Because uh, there has been this revolution going on um, in two areas. And one is the one that we just saw, the analysis techniques for Lagrangian data. And the other one is the experimental techniques for um, following passive particles in flows, densely seeded. And uh, yeah, together these two techniques um, yeah, give us the opportunity to follow not maybe each and every molecule, but a represent, represent, representative uh, fluid parcel in the whole reactor, right? So then we can all of a sudden ask uh, which is, are the molecules that another molecule encounters. We can just try to address these questions that Levenspiel and Dankwitz had with these new techniques. <clears throat> and I think this will maybe lead to a revolution uh, in chemical engineering. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I will shortly review residence time theory. Then I will quickly introduce particle tracking velocimetry. Um, I show some measurements that we did in a stir tank. Here's already some movie out of it. And then I will quickly try to uh, talk about the residence, uh, the Lagrangian mixing analysis that we used on this data and give a short outlook. Okay, so the questions that Dunkworth and Levenspiel were asking is what do molecules experience in the system? Um, for uh, the experimental, um, let's say, possibilities they were having, they could not follow each molecule. They could just get indirect information looking at the residence time distribution function, E um, as a function of the time, the residence time at the exit. And usually what is done to get this is you make a little delta pulse of change in concentration at the inlet of the reactor and measure it at the outlet. So uh, if you have a plug flow, just a normal plug flow, and you have a pulse at the inlet, you will get just a pulse at the outlet of concentration. And this is then your exit age distribution function. In a completely mixed flow, this exit time distribution function will be um, decreasing exponential. And in some arbitrary flow, it might look this weird like this. So the good thing is, once you have this, and you know you have a first order reaction, you can get the whole conversion of your reactant A uh, in the process. So you know um, how much um, of the uh, concentration you put in, you are also get out, right? And of course, you want this to be very small because you want a lot of conversion going on. And um, uh, yeah, you can calculate it with it. However, uh, if you have a chemical reaction other than first order, you cannot uh, use this as simply anymore. And there's just one example I want to show you. If you have early mixing, and then you have a flat velocity profile where there's no mixing, or you have first a flat velocity profile and then late mixing, um, you in these two reactors, and also in this where you have a mixture of that, you will get the same um, residence distribution function, but residence time distribution function. However, your conversion will be very diff different because here A and B, for instance, two reactants can uh, meet and react to C the whole time here, while here they only meet when they mix and they have no time to react. So you have a very different conversion in these two cases, even though you have the same residence time distribution function. You can have also problems with micro or macro fluid. I don't want to get into details here or dead water in the system. So areas that do not take part in the mixing at all or in the act at all. In the last years, we were especially, um, um, we especially considered competitive consecutive reactions. And there is, is uh, it's extremely important that you know all the details about the mixing in your system, because um, if you have 
a slow reaction in comparison to the mixing, then you will get a lot of your first product. If you have a fast reaction in comparison to the mixing time scales, then you would mostly get the second product. So you need to know, uh, normally you favor one of the products and you need to know um, uh, how how reaction, uh, how mixing and reaction is um, occurring in your um, reactor. Okay. So to address these questions here, um, we cannot get this from residence time theory, but now we can get it from Lagrangian particle tracking, 4D PTV. Basically, the idea of 4D PTV is that you have a lot of cameras um, that look on your, ever, your flow uh, domain. And in the flow domain, you have some um, particles that are fluorescent, for instance, and uh, you have you record them. And then you have from the recorded images, you kind of back triangulate it uh, via a calibration into the real world. And then you do this for all your time steps. You, you took the pictures and then you back connect uh, the traces here. <clears throat> so this historically has been done for a while and uh, maybe it's like around 30 years or so since um, high-speed cameras came up and, and so, but uh, in the last years, maybe since 2013, there has been some disruptive uh, development um, in the algorithms. So there are several steps necessary to, to get to the shake the box algorithm that I will shortly introduce. And the important thing is that with these new disruptive development algorithms, we can go to densely seeded flows, which wasn't possible before. So before we had uh, parts in our flow domain, which were not resolved, where we didn't have data. Uh, okay, so um, this is what is done. All the high-speed cameras that take images of a lot of particles and some flow. Here what was a rayleigh banar cell. It um, actually was done by a group which was a neighboring department where, uh, for my department when I worked at the German Aerospace um, Center. And uh, they showed that can go to very, very high particle densities and track in this uh, very tall ready banal convection cell, like uh, uh, over 500,000 tracers. So it's really a matured thing now. Okay, so the basic, let's say disruptive part is that instead of triangulating each of these bright um, uh, spots in your camera images uh, to the world space, you do this only for the first few steps. And then uh, you take your, your particles and you put a, a polynomial fit and you extrapolate the new position of the particle in the world space already. So here in the world space already. So you don't have to do <laughs> all this reconstruction first, but you uh, just to spare this part. Yeah. So it makes it computational um, very, uh, very um, time, uh, time um, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, very uh, time saving. So we have this predicted tracks and uh, now you need a correction step for this predictive track tracks. And this correction step is called uh, also the shaking step. And what you do then from this predicted particles, you back project onto the camera images using your calibration, and then you compare to the real images at that time. Yeah, you kind of make a residual, which you minimize. And you do this by shaking these predicted like a little bit in X, Y, and Z in the world position. Okay, and this goes around um, and around, and I don't want to go into all the details, but it's really made the difference now. So you can uh, fastly, calculate reliably the tracks of densely seeded particles. Okay, so let me go to our measurements. We use this uh, um, shake the box algorithm um, for measuring um, trajectories in a stirred tank reactor. So um, this is the motor, here's the reactor with two Russian stirrers. Um, here's the high power LEDs and the camera stack. And we went through the whole procedure you need to do some calibration, volume self calibration, and so on and so on. And finally, uh, we did the shake the box. So we get the reconstructed particles out of our, um, here, not all the particles are, are plotted because otherwise you wouldn't see the reactor anymore. So you get a very dense uh, tracks uh, um, at each time step um, from your particles. Yeah. And 
what can you do with it? You can do some statistics out of it, Lagrangian statistics. So you can calculate Lagrangian velocities, Lagrangian um, accelerations. And from this also you can calculate, for instance, forces, which is not possible if you just have the velocity field, the Eulerian velocity field of your, um, of your doing particle image velocimetry, for example. Um, and also, of course, you can also by interpolation get your velocity field, but you can also calculate Lagrangian coherent structures. Okay, so um, this is what we did. I show you some uh, animation of the FTLE field, <laughs> even though it's a bit an old <laughs> LCS method. Um, and I will shortly explain a bit about Lagrangian mixing analysis only advective. Um, yeah, barriers in that sense. So not what uh, George Haller just uh, introduced. And um, I want to differentiate volumes um, of, let's say, uh, non-mixed material and barriers, which um, kind of, uh, yeah, sometimes they're the surrounding of these volumes, but uh, sometimes they're also yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, lines or surfaces, material surfaces in the flow. And we analyzed both. So the barriers we analyzed using first, um, uh, um, we, we, we did this analysis first in another flow, in a flow behind um, a rising bu well, a bubble hold still in a counter flow. We analyzed the Lagrangian current structures as suggested, the advective barriers as suggested by Haller and his um, co workers. Um, where we um, saw the attracting and repelling, so the repelling in red and the attracting barrier here in, in this flow. And this was a 2D flow because uh, it was symmetrical around the whole axis. So it's an almost 2D flow, so we could evaluate it 2D. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the good thing about them is that really what they show, the blue line, the attracting line attracts Sorry, I'm sorry, this is just not. The blue line attracts um, the particles. So it meant that particles from very far in the flow field come and um, go to this blue line. Um, and the red line means that particles on either side of this red line, they will uh, in the future, like go largely separate. Uh, like also it doesn't matter on which side you put them, will largely separate. So um, this, gives you the information about the time interval of your interest, how the advective barriers are spread. And we saw this is also really um, agrees very well with residence time. If you look at the uh, several particles and um, see how long they stay here, then they stay there a long time within this red uh, LCS. So this is really a barrier to transport here. Okay, um, however, we also analyzed the finite time Lyapunov exponent. And um, yeah, since now we didn't get so much introduction on this and had the more elaborate methods, I will go maybe a bit into detail how you calculate this in principle, but you can calculate it from the flow map, but you can also calculate it from um, yeah, two particles. They have initial distance and after a while they have a, a stretched distance after um, interval delta t. And if you have the ratio of it and the logarithm of it, and you divide, you normalize by, no, you divide by the, yeah, by the time, the integration time, you get the forward FTLE field. And if you do this um, in backward time, you get the um, backward FTLE field. And basically, as you can see, ridges of high backward FTLE field coincide with your um, LCS. Uh, with a more, like say, correct mathematic, correct method um, introduced by uh, George Haller. But you will also have not as clear, uh, not as, uh, as strong other ridges in your FTLE field um, that, you, that you maybe did not detect in your LCS analysis. Okay, so, but here you can see also it mostly coincides with this um, LCS. And from this um, finite time the upper component, which means if it's high, for instance, if the forward is high, it means particles there will separate a lot. So there's a lot of stretching. And if you make now um, uh, the 
product out of these two, the forward and the back to the FTLE, and take the square root out of it, then you have kind of a mixing intensity. So where both are high, particles that um, have come together from very far apart will also go very far apart in the future. So it's a kind of a mixing intensity. In the sense of Corona, it would be an airport. airport. So <laughs> people come from everywhere, go everywhere. So it's something which in case of Corona, you don't want, but in case of mixing, these areas are interesting. They are the hubs. Okay, and we chose this analysis technique here, this maybe a bit old analysis technique from the uh, for LCS because it's so easily applicable in 3D. And that's why we chose it to applicate it to our um, to our Sturt tank reactor. And I have to admit, we um, used it for um, data that we got from, or trajectories that we got from a numerical simulation. This simulation was validated by our 4D PTV experiments. And on this, we calculated the FTLE. Okay. So this is the results for um, um, integration time, which corresponds to two thirds of a zero revolutions at 250 RPM. And uh, yeah, you can see that the forward FTLE field, so which defines the areas where stretching is very high in forward time. Um, you can see that at the stirrer uh, regions, it's very high, which you would also expect because particles go here and they go here. So it's very high, but you also see a lot of small scale stuff going on. At the same areas, also the backward FTLE is high, maybe a bit more outside here. Um, and the mixing intensity, which is the product of both, um, or the square root of the product of both, is also high here. So from this, you can, first of all, not really tell, well, is this now a barrier to transport, or is it not? Because it's like, yeah, there's so many small scale stuff going on. You can definitely tell that here there's a little, very little mixing, which might make sense because this is just the area where no um, baffles are. But um, yes, uh, you, you cannot really see uh, the, the barriers to transport. Also, if you look at this um, cut plane from above, you see that uh, these high FGLE values, they don't persist uh, towards the rim of the um, reactor. That means that, uh, yeah, if you have a strap substrate, which you put in here, it could easily pass here on the outside to the bottom. So it's not really maybe a transport hindrance. However, we know from experiments, and this is an experiment where you put in some tracer here, some substrate, and it's a mixing time experiment, that here is some kind of a barrier to, to mixing. You can clearly see it, right? You can clearly see it by this, um, by this mixing time experiment. So this is analysis from the mixing time experiment. This means here mixing is fast, here it's a bit slow, here it's also slow. So it's analysis from this, from this um, on this video. And now we use another approach to LCS. We say, okay, let's go to this encounter um, idea of Dunkworth. He said, okay, we need to know if two particles encounter because only then they can uh, kind of mix and, and, and react. And this is done by the theory, which uh, also was yeah, um, evolved by Professor Pat Bagela from the Lafana University. It's called a trajectory based network methods. And the basic idea is that you have your trajectories. So you have your trajectories, and you consider some epsilon um, around it, some, some, some area around it. And if they get epsilon close, these two trajectories in one time step, you uh, make um, a one in an adjacency matrix. Yeah? Otherwise, it's zero. And so you have an adjacency matrix for each time step. From this, you can get a network weight matrix, which is just the sum of all these adjacency matrix. And from this, you can get a diagonal degree matrix, which encodes the number of contacts of each particle. So using these two um, matrices, the W and D, um, you can use some spectral clustering um, and identify some coherent volumes. So particles that meet a lot and go together. Right, and um, then you can also analyze a cluster coefficient, which tells you if a particle has a possibility to belong to one of these clusters or not to belong to one of these clusters. So if this is high, then it's actually 
likely to belong to one of those clusters. If it's low, then it's just incoherent background. So and with this, you can analyze your clusters and you can get your clusters here shown at the initial time step and here shown at the final time step. So um, you have here, this is the cluster, um, which is here, the particles are highly ordered, but if you affect them in time, they're disordered. They mix within it a lot because they're at the stirrer plane, but they do not mix with the other clusters. So each cluster within itself, it's mixed. So it's microfluid, but <laughs> with the other clusters, it's kind of a macrofluid. It cannot mix. So it's macro mixing. Well, this um, coincided very well with what we saw from the experiment. What you might maybe also figure from the, um, a bit from the FTLE analysis, even though here, uh, yeah, you thought that there is a lot of barriers maybe, but that's not so true. It's small scale barriers, which are not so important for large scale mixing. All right. And um, yeah, so with this, we are able to detect now the macro mixing in the reactor. And yeah, this is my last slide. I hope I finish. Uh, yeah, with this now, using the PTV experiments and the Lagrangian network analysis, or maybe also other LCS techniques, we can now um, help to understand really what's going on inside the reactor. So the full experience of fluid passes inside the reactor, mimicking the molecules, decide early or late mixing because we have the full picture, and um, dead water, micro microfluids, we can build correct compartment models. So we know what's going on in each part of the reactor. So we can just build correct compartment models and uh, also get um, some ideas about the mixing statistic because we have all the trajectories. So we can get an effective diffusion out of it, right? Yes, and I think that's it. <laughs> I thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm very happy that we just also got funding for going on in this direction. And uh, yeah, I want to end with another quote of Dunkwitz that we should uh, do more rumina ruminating, put the feet on the stove and uh, uh, yeah, think about the stuff a bit more and be a bit le less in a hassle with administrative burdens and so on. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Alexandra. I think uh, the point about um, being too busy is perhaps, um, maybe we didn't learn that lesson. Um, any, uh, any brief, we've got a couple of minutes before, um, no questions, no questions in the chat. I don't know if anybody's got any comments, questions. I mean, I might ask one. I, I wonder whether you thought of, um, uh, using different types of stirrers uh, with this method. I mean, obviously there's significant computational intensity associated with that, but, uh, you know, I always wonder about whether, well, lots of people say these turbines are not particularly well suited. Mm, yeah, actually, um, there was a PhD st um, student at the, oh, or a thesis defended, just defended at the um, IMS, who uh, looked at uh, different stirrers um, and different settings of stirrers um, experimentally. And um, of course this is done. And I, well, my aim was not so much showing everything that uh, we have done on this, but more like showing the possibilities of this method. So I don't, didn't go too much into detail no. about anything less actually, because I wanted to point out like the connection of these methods, yeah. yeah. So, but you could, in principle, anyway. Uh, Veronique Roig from Toulouse, over to you. Okay, can you see my um, my screen? Is it okay? Works well, yes. Okay. Uh, so, thank you uh, to everybody for attending this uh, talk. And uh, of course, uh, I would like uh, to warmly uh, thank uh, Alain Linné and, uh, and Michel Schluter, who invited me to, to give uh, this talk. So I'm not at all a specialist of uh, Lagrangian uh, current structure analysis. And the talk I will give is, um, of course, concerned by mixing and also possibilities of measurement of uh, velocity in the liquid phase and of mass transfer 
So of the concentration field around bubbles, so I think the link is uh, possible, but you will see that before, prior to Lagrangian current structure analysis, sometimes it's already difficult to, to have a measurement, precise measurements, and also to, to try to, to build models. So the, the talk is about uh, uh, flows in uh, bubbly flows that are confined. And so to, to try to motivate you to listen to me, uh, I have entitled this talk, Are Inertial Bubbly Flows Confined in Planar Syngap Cells? possible innovative bubbly reactors. It's a work that uh, we have done uh, with uh, my colleagues, Patricia Ern and uh, Sebastian uh, Kazen, those uh, last uh, years at IMFT, but also with a lot of other colleagues uh, from uh, IMFT and from uh, other laboratories. And, uh, and so, uh, the, as an introduction, I would say that, uh, in the context of, uh, uh, I, I hope you, you do not see this, uh, uh, okay. In the context of uh, bubble column technology, uh, where we have to perform mass transfer, uh, mixing, etc. Usually, you know, two uh, bubble reactor, very large one, where uh, you have uh, efficient mixing and uh, very restricted one with small sizes, uh, that are built to enhance uh, transfer, uh, but as uh, Michel uh, mentioned, uh, where we, ha we have some limitation due to saturation in plug flow. So in our team, we have uh, explored an alternative intermediate configuration that can uh, combine the advantage of enhanced, enhanced mass transfer due to confinement and efficient uh, mixing because bubbles are free to move in a, in a plane. So those bubbles, they are in a syngap cell because uh, typically you have a meter uh, as dimension in the plane of the cell, but the bubbles are confined between two plates separated by a very thin uh, distance, a very small distance. And the bubbles have a, a diameter that is uh, uh, of course, larger than uh, this uh, distance. So, okay. There is a problem of uh, progression of uh, my... Uh... Okay, so the application can be uh, uh, new uh, photobioreactors for microalgae uh, cultivations that could uh, be installed in a bio facade, photochemistry, uh, flat uh, sheet membrane bioreactors. There are a lot of opportunities uh, to improve the efficiency of uh, reactors, bubbly reactors. In this uh, talk, uh, I will show first what are the specific uh, parameters of the flow configuration. Then I will speak rapidly about the flow around an isolated uh, bubble before describing the agitation in a, in a swarm of bubbles. And then I will speak about mixing and uh, mass uh, transfer. So the flow configuration, we consider isolated bubbles or uh, homogeneous bubble swarms rising in a liquid at rest. And this liquid is confined between two vertical plates. The cap width W is always lower than the capillary length for water about uh, three millimeters. And uh, uh, we use bubbles that have an equivalent diameter that is at least four millimeters. This diameter being very large as compared to the distance between the walls, the bubbles are flattened. They are like two dimensional and the flow far away, this bubble, is parallel to the walls. In fact, in our condition, there is no de-wetting, so that there is always a liquid film between the bubbles and the walls. 
The Reynolds number defined with the velocity of the, the bubble and its diameter, or a Reynolds number of the channel flow, uh, are large, and the Weber no number is around one. So we are in an inertial regime where bubble can have uh, in-plane deformation. Inertial regime means that we have a, a possibility to have a strong waves uh, with, uh, in particular, a von Karman uh, street. And uh, here you see the in-plane deformation of, uh, of the bubble. And the gas liquid, uh, the gas volume uh, fraction we, we observe uh, when we are in a swarm are from uh, the quite uh, small to moderate uh, one. The kinematics uh, of an isolated uh, uh, confined uh, bubble uh, show that depending on uh, the, the volume uh, or the Archimedes number injected in the cell, you may have for tiny bubbles a straight uh, path uh, at constant velocity. When uh, the uh, volume increases, you have first uh, the oscillatory paths for ellipsoidal bubble that do not oscillate in shape. And then when you increase the bubble, those bubbles more, moreover can oscillate in, in shape before recovering for the largest uh, volume, uh, a steady uh, trajectory uh, for what we call, it's the equivalent to uh, spherical cap bubbles in three-dimensional flow here. It's uh, uh, an emi cylindrical cap uh, bubble. And so for those bubbles, we know quite uh, well the scaling law for the velocities, the frequencies, etc., which of course are completely different from what is observed for bubbles free to move in an unconfined uh, uh, space. So the flow around an isolated uh, bubble, It's not very easy to describe the velocity perturbation induced in the liquid by the bubble. And uh, we have used two uh, levels of uh, uh, description, a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional one. In fact, uh, the velocity is a three-component uh, vector depending on three position uh, uh, spatial coordinates and on time around the, the, the bubble. And we can do with a low cost 2D description of not of this vector, but of a velocity average through the gap. For that, we use the PIV with volume uh, lighting system. In fact, we have here a scheme with a cell that is seen from the top, the gravity is here, and zeta is a coordinate perpendicular uh, to the, the cell. If you, uh, uh, you have a volume lighting, the intersection with the cell produces a laser sheet, and uh, we can measure, if the distribution of tracer is uniform, the mean velocity across uh, the, the cell. In that case, it is assumed that the velocity component in zeta direction is a minor contribution, and what we measure with PIV is uh, a two component in uh, X and Y coordinates uh, uh, velocity field with all the components that are average through the gap, okay? And uh, with such a, a description of uh, the velocity field, we can, for a part, say important things about the velocity perturbation induced in the liquid by an isolated bubble. Here you have an oscillating bubble with a small Archimedes, and here the wake of a large uh, bubble. And uh, in color, you have normalized vorticities. In fact, you see a general property that is the wake uh, even when there is a uh, uh, released vorticity, the wake is strongly attenuated because the vorticity decreases very rapidly as well as the velocity. And it is the same thing for the largest uh, bubble. And in fact, it's an exponential attenuation that is simply due to the fact that, the, for example, the vortices, they are uh, affected by shear stress at the, at the wall. 
And with this method, we have no information near the bubble because uh, it's uh, quite uh, noisy. Of course, if you have uh, more uh, money, you can uh, describe more precisely with a, a three-dimensional uh, velocity uh, distribution uh, uh, using tomographic PIV and uh, shake the box or to tomographic uh, PTV with shake uh, the box uh, technique. And uh, for that, you need here four cameras with a high speed uh, uh, laser in front of, uh, of the, uh, the cell. And uh, so you can uh, say, okay, I'm working to try to have the true velocity all the components and the distribution in space. The problem is that in our condition, we have a very thin and anisotropic measurement uh, volume. And uh, we have uh, to use very tiny tracers to be very careful with the calibration. And even if we can validate the measurement, it remains that for a bubble rising in uh, the cell, we have velocities in the plane that are large, uh, far larger than the velocity uh, perpendicular to the plane of the cell. So while we can access with no problem to both components of the velocity in the plane and, the, and in particular the distribution through the gap with zeta coordinate, it's not always possible to measure precisely the uh, component of the velocity perpendicular to uh, the, the plate. I show you uh, what is possible for a flow uh, around an oscillating bubble. If you look at uh, uh, the velocity around a bubble that is here and that was uh, all along this trajectory here, at a given time, through the gap at those points, we have all the profiles of velocity through the gap. So we capture the shear stress. And also if we look at the zoom of this uh, vortex here and uh, at different zeta sheets, we see that uh, they do not move exactly at the same rotation uh, rate. It's okay, but measurement of the perpendicular uh, component is not possible. In fact, it's possible to measure the uh, wall components of the velocity uh, when you consider the flow around a large bubble with stationary paths. Because you can develop shake the box, uh, box post-processing. Because if you are working in the reference frame of the bubble, all the components become of the same uh, uh, level. And uh, combining all the images, because the, the motion is stationary, you can accumulate a lot of uh, tracers and follow uh, precisely uh, those, uh, those tracers. So that I have shown here a comparison between a three-dimensional description and a, a, a PIV uh, description of the flow around a big uh, bubble that would be present here. And uh, you see in the three-dimensional uh, description by Shake uh, the Box technique that we can prove directly that there is a rolling of the trajectories in front of the bubble. And uh, in fact, uh, this is half uh, a gap uh, thickness. So we have its symmetrical uh, part. So we have two spanwise vortices in front of a bubble. Uh, which was uh, for us uh, a question for a long time, but in fact, it's stupid because uh, it's very similar to uh, what happens for a dipolar in a propagating in shallow uh, water. This um, uh, spanwise vortex is, uh, is uh, robust. I skip uh, the conclusion about uh, uh, what the way to measure uh, the, the, the velocity, just uh, it's clear that Tomo PTV is uh, necessary if uh, we want to measure near the interface. So it's important for mass transfer analysis. And also I can say that numerical methods 
uh, that have been uh, published with Gap-Average Navier-Stokes uh, equation uh, must be used with caution, but we can talk about that uh, later. Rapidly also, I want you uh, to give you uh, a view of uh, uh, the agitation in the liquid when we have a swarm of bubbles. Uh, here of the same size. Just looking at a PIV film, you can retain the main idea is that the agitation in the liquid is dominated first by wakes and by a few wakes interactions. And uh, in this flow, there is such a damping of the motion by the confinement that really those ingredients, the wake and uh, the two-dimensional uh, vortices, which have the most uh, energy, most important part of the energy, they are they generate random agitation, but this is not turbulence at all. And please never use Kepsilon model to predict that, because of those uh, vortices, they cannot be tilted, they cannot diffuse because uh, first they die, and they uh, neither can be stretched. So, in this very strange uh, agitation, uh, we have uh, performed uh, a complete statistical description. And uh, the conclusion, I skip the gray part, is that it's not turbulence, but we have a specific no model nearly uh, closed that uh, exists. So from now, I'm going to show you some uh, results about mixing of a dye with low diffusivity. So we have performed uh, experiments uh, with uh, PELIF, uh, uh, leaf and absorption. And uh, there are also interesting uh, numerical simulation for the mixing of uh, temperature. I will uh, speak about the mixing of dye. And so uh, here we inject uh, a tracer and varying the gas volume fraction we try to see how thing evolves. And uh, at first we had uh, an evidence, sorry, we had an evidence. It was that uh, uh, the mixing is not at all a simple diffusion in the cell. Uh, with low frequency uh, PELIF, we observed this window, in this window, the mass of uh, uh, a dye. Uh, so the mass of a dye we know that it evolves through the fluxes exchanged with, at the frontiers with a, a, a flux here. And uh, when we plot the mass of uh, the, the dye as a function of time in semi-log plot, for example, for a given gas volume fraction, we see that we have an exponential decay. And uh, this is completely different from what would happen if we were putting here a thick uh, low for the, the diffusive uh, uh, flux, okay? So we can retain that uh, the, the specific mixing mechanism is not diffusion. And uh, visualize the concentration field, just the comparison of the concentration field and the velocity field morphologies lead us to, to say they are very similar. And so this suggests an important role of the wake in the transport of the concentration. So it's confi co confirmed uh, with the spectral uh, signature of uh, concentration uh, in time at a point that leads us to develop a chaotic advection model where the wake uh, creates this advection. So here I have a, a, a view of a spot of a dense concentration. And the, at the front here, we see quite clearly how the bubble uh, propagates the, the frontier. In fact, if you look at different successive views uh, with a bubble here that moves uh, upward, you will see that this bubble uh, captures a, a volume of dye in its wake. Okay, and it propagates, it, it transports without exchange 
in this way, this concentration for a finite distance, and here more or less. Then after it releases the the, the dye, and this dye spreads. And so this is a basic idea for a one-dimensional model that uh, we have uh, developed and compared with absorption uh, experiments. So uh, the model is based on the, the scenario uh, I mentioned, but it has two unknown uh, parameters, the volume uh, uh, of dye that is transported and the distance over which it is transported without a exchange. Then the bubble velocity, uh, their density are known. And uh, here we have a, a visualization in a finite window of the dye. And uh, we transform this information in one dimensional because we average over all the lines the concentration and we plot them as a function of the vertical direction. This is done here. And uh, we see at a given time, a profile of the concentration that will then evolving, will be evolving in time. And so from the comparison between those profiles and those predicted by the model for short time, we can determine the known parameters Vt and L that are the best for the comparison. And for longer time, we can look if we want uh, at the prediction of uh, the model. And in fact, the comparison is completely satisfactory if we use optimized parameters that are given here for a different gas volume fraction. And what is very uh, uh, nice, it's when you find at the end that those parameters have really uh, physical uh, meaning. The volume uh, of uh, dye that is transport is twice the volume of the bubble, and it's the weight volume, more or less. And also the distance L uh, over which you propagate uh, the, the concentration without exchange before you release it. For low gas volume fraction, you see it's uh, the, the vortex dumping length. And then for the highest volume fraction, it decreases and it decreases with this uh, uh, low. And in fact, it's because it's uh, uh, the, the wake are crossed by uh, other bubbles. And so this creates decorrelation and the L is the mean uh, vertical distance bet between the, the bubbles. So we have a, a model that is not a diffusive uh, process huh, because the symmetry factor is not uh, zero. And then for this model, we have an effective diffusivity. And uh, this diffusivity as a function of the gas uh, volume uh, fraction evolves uh, the, the, in, uh, the, in black dots, uh, non-linearly with alpha. But what is interesting is that uh, if we look in green, uh, the evolution of, of an effective diffusivity in unconfined three motion of a swarm uh, in three-dimensional uh, uh, tank, we have similar values, not so far, and the similar uh, saturation effect with alpha. Uh, which is all also uh, related to, to shortening uh, of, uh, of the distance L of transport. So, I can say that mixing is efficient as in three-dimensional bubbly flows, despite a strong uh, confinement. And uh, then I, I want to, to see if a mass transfer uh, can be uh, described uh, if we can follow uh, the passes of uh, uh, a dye in, uh, in this flow and if it's efficient. And so for that, we have used two methods uh, to obtain time resolve uh, dissolved concentration. Uh, either reactive mass transfer system, colorimetric system, or laser induced uh, fluorescence, for which you have nice uh, uh, reviews from the team uh, of uh, Michael Schluter. 
And with those methods, we have obtained either with the colorimetry, an averaged concentration. For us, it was oxygen, but, but for other people, it can be another dye. Uh, and it's in plain description, and it is time resolved. But for laser induced uh, fluorescence with inhibition that we used, we were just able to have uh, uh, the uh, description of the distribution in the plane of the cell of uh, the average concentration across the gap, just for very large time. In fact, this is due in our method, this skip this part, uh, due to the nonlinear relation uh, between the intensity that uh, a camera sees and the concentration uh, that is uh, uh, emitting this intensity. So when we see such uh, an oxygen, some uh, le uh, gray level related to oxygen uh, in the far wake of a bubble, it's qualitative view. In fact, it, it's qualitative view, uh, except it, uh, if, you, if you wait for very large time, when uh, all the concentration is uniform across the, the gap. And so uh, with colorimetric uh, methods, we have uh, no problem because uh, uh, we have access uh, to uh, uh, a gray level and uh, uh, concentration relation that is linear. So we can have uh, uh, really something uh, during uh, during time, and that is uh, uh, completely completely true. So uh, we have used uh, two colorimetric methods. One developed uh, in Germany by uh, Sonia Eres uh, Paulis, and uh, one in Toulouse by uh, Nicola uh, Dietrich. And uh, what we see is that okay, uh, we can uh, uh, observe with Pelifi. Uh, some uh, uh, link between the vortices and the uh, accumulation of, uh, of dye. We can interpret, for example, after a big bubble, uh, the fact that this over concentration is coming from the surrounding uh, flow around the compound uh, body of the, the bubble and uh, the recirculating uh, uh, wake. But this is not very, very uh, deep. And uh, in fact, the problem coming is coming to the end of your time, Veronique. OK, OK. Yeah. So I can just say that if you want, you can look at uh, the following part of uh, the, the speech, uh, where we, we can have some uh, very uh, teeny uh, proofs of uh, three-dimensional effects uh, that are uh, important for mass transfer and for transport of, uh, of the dye in the vicinity, but also uh, far away from uh, the, the bubbles. And uh, I, I can show you, for example, this very large layer, just to conclude, a uh, uh, very large layer of dye that precedes the, the bubbles and which is completely explained by this recirculation uh, and spiral span wise uh, vortices, or that was proved also for uh, those uh, oscillating bubbles with uh, uh, a numerical simulation of Ganesh. So I want to thank you for your attention and uh, sorry for being uh, uh, so long. I must say also that uh, this flow is good for, for mass transfer. Because the fluxes were for the same volume for a bubble when it is confined or not, well, the flux is always greater. Thank you very much. Lovely, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, there aren't any questions in the chat anyway, and I think we need to move on. So let's pass on to Anna Hoffman from the BASF company who's going to uh, give us the last presentation. Hey, yeah, hello everybody. Good afternoon. 
thank you very much for the invite. That gives me the chance to listen to very inspiring talks. Um, I will probably less contribute to the theory, but rather to how do we intend to applicate uh, your findings, apply your findings to our specific problems. Um, the, um, the title of my talk is Streamline Analysis of CFD Simulations to Evaluate the Process Performance of Steer Tank Tractors. And I will do that by showing you some examples, some challenges, and how do we apply that. And um, of course, I would like to mention my colleague, Sebastian Meinecke, who essentially provided the simulation examples. Can you please change into the into the presentation mode? Uh, sorry. Put it, yeah, put it in the presentation mode. Okay. Uh, no, it's in the it's still in the wrong sort of presentation mode. So it's now it should be in the right one. Excellent. That's okay, sorry. Shows on my screen. All right. Um, yeah, it was already mentioned at the beginning um, that um, many chemical reactors we only design based on a zero D understanding instead of using full fledged three D simulations. And very often that's the case because uh, kinetics played a major role. So you're more focusing on these, these aspects, for example. And then, um, of course, you, you're you probably more dealing with those issues instead of better understanding uh, mixing or um, the flow field in general in those kind of reactors. Um, this usually then allows you to really look deep into the processes that you are interested in terms of formation of solids, for example, or I shall, uh, which I will show later, polymer processing and so forth. Um, but in general, all these approaches, of course, they ignore the mixing processes. And of course, the inhomogeneities that I usually have in such reactors that, on the other hand, influence, of course, the product properties and, of course, the product quality in many aspects. And this is one important aspect we always have to look into to better understand how we can improve those factors. Um, I would like to show you some, some challenges that we generally have. Um, first of all, it would be fermentation. Yeah, that what we have is usually a two-phase flow because we have aeration um, that we need in many, in many of those processes. We have, as the reactors are large, usually also steep gradients in concentration. We have strongly uh, varying viscosities. So sometimes over several orders of magnitude. And of course, we have the complexive bio biocatalysis, yeah, which itself is complex to describe, but uh, what makes it even more complex, it strongly depends on the environment and the history. So that also relates, of course, then to the question, what does a fluid element see on its way through an erector? And to make things worse, of course, we have very long time scales. So we're speaking about um, hours sometimes compared to seconds that we have in mixing. Um, we have precipitation. That's another process we very often do in stir tanks. Um, so we know that we have different process steps there. So nucleation grows in agglomeration um, by building up these particles. And uh, of course, the uh, nucleation of the seeds that depend on both of mixing chemical environments. Um, then we have a much slower process usually that's uh, grows in agglomeration processes. And unfortunately, they're all usually um, yeah, um, happen in the same reactor at the same time, at the same place sometimes even. Um, so you can describe them in, in theory, but in the end of the day, it's very difficult to measure those processes independently, even under very defined conditions, I would say. And therefore, um, it's of course then hard to come up with a model and with a simulation that's somehow predictive, yeah, which is our goal usually. And then we have something like polymerization. Um, we also had that mixing reaction time scales is important, yeah, how they correlate with each other. Um, you have usually consecutive parallel reactions happening at the same time. Um, so this is quite a complex uh, problem to approach, especially with uh, time averaged um, solution methods that we usually employ when using CFD. Um, and if you look at the product we are interested in, it's probably not like in basic chemicals, uh, but with polymers, you're usually interested in the molar mass distribution and the structure of the polymers you're making. And they, of course, depend uh, uh, on the kinetic itself, which is complex. Um, and they also depend, of course, on the time history of the, uh, those already built molecules. 
So to describe that, you can do that, but you need complex kinetic models and solvers, and therefore you usually also constrain yourself to zero D simulations and not coupled, fully couple them, even if you know the kinetics with a CFD solver. Yeah, by saying that, we are usually interested in all these three examples, we are usually interested or try to simulate the, um, the process product function. So we want to bring together via, with a simulation, the operation conditions, the geometry of the reactor and so forth, um, that's represented by the CFD, as well as the description of the product um, quantities or product, um, yeah, product structure and so forth which is then usually defined by a, a suitable kinetics. Um, but to do that, yeah, we have to take into consideration the size of a reactor and the process time. And usually in many processes that I've shown you, this is still limited. And um, I would even uh, dare to say this is a fully coupled approach for many of these examples still not uh, possible even in the foreseeable future because the, uh, the effort is just too high. And, if you speak about also um, industrial applications, of course, we are even more so uh, limited in available times for simulations. So therefore you are also trying to test new approaches to couple either the simulation process conditions or um, yeah, um, how to more efficiently couple it or on the other hand, how to decouple it efficiently in a way uh, that we can still combine uh, the best of both worlds. Um, usually, um, in all these examples, um, and I said that at the beginning, um, the distribution plays a role. And we have a lot of distribution. Zero D models never have a distribution in that respect, but of course, three D models have. And we know that something like shear rates distribution, concentration distribution, everything has an influence later on on residence time distribution. Of course, uh, has an impact on uh, the product that we are. Um, producing in those uh, tank reactors. And uh, therefore an understanding about the influence of those uh, variables or the distribution of those variables, that's crucial for the scale up. And of course you can say the product transfer. That means if we put, uh, produce a product or develop a product in a lab environment, for example, we have to still transfer to a, a production scale. So um, even if you don't scale up the reactor, you scale up a recipe and that would you probably call up a product transfer just to be precise. So um, what also happens of course is that you have, of course we are producing products and successfully producing products. Then you, have an, then you know what you have at plant scale, but sometimes it's not necessarily working as you expect. And then the question arises, okay, how can I improve my understanding or what can I do better next time um, if I bring that, um, if I can my lab recipe to the plant? And the problem very often is then that, of course, the, the plant scale has a certain, for example, shear rate distribution and that you can calculate it uh, based on a simulation of the tank, but the lab scale has a different one. And of course, if they are, if they look the same in just geometric scaling it up, then you usually are limited and you are not coming up with the same shear rate distribution. So therefore to probably be more, uh, to have a better understanding or a safer scale up, you try to mimic distribution of a shear rate, both in plant and lab scale, even if directors look different. Yeah, with that, so to speak, a rather, rather simple approach, uh, we would try to, let's say, minimize the uncertainties if we transfer things. We still don't know anything about kinetics. Yeah, This is not thinking about kinetics, about all the, uh, the interesting things I learned this morning about how to better characterize the flow field for mixing, for example. But it's the first step that also helps in uh, yeah, uh, our colleagues to be more precise. Yeah, So it's a pure hydrodynamic approach usually. Um, and uh, but it helps in 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 many aspects already, and of course uh, to do that uh, to be successful that you not only need to describe it properly with the simulation you also have to apply that later on in the lab or in production yeah those methods has to be have to be applied in a certain manner that it that it really works and that uh, you use some sort of a simulation driven approach. Um, we have. 
of course, tested other things to come up by combining, as I said, fluid simulation and kinetics. So to, to describe uh, product properties. Um, we have, it was mentioned, I would start with that with compartment modeling, of course. Yeah, so uh, where we really try uh, to come one step close, or let's say relax the approximation of uh, COD, simple COD systems to uh, as, uh, yeah, an ag aggregate of many, uh, let's say, ideal stirred tank reactors, so that um, you probably only have to uh, a very small fraction of cells compared to a full CTFC simulation in a compartment model where you run then more complex kinetics. So for example, instead of a million CFD cells where you have to calculate the kinetics, you would do that maybe in a thousand or maybe even 10,000 um, cells, but still it would, would be computation much more feasible. Uh, another tr interesting thing is, of course, if you can couple it somehow, you can uh, you can use RCFD methods where you average time scales and use data-based extrapolation to speed up calculation is also one thing for interstitial mixing, which might help, but we are in an early stage of exploring that. And um, yeah, that was probably uh, where we said, okay, how can we contribute to the topic of today, the streamlined approach? How can we adapt to the Lagrangian descriptions uh, by extracting streamlines from a CFD calculation? So a very, I would say, rather simple approach of doing that. So um, coming then to the examples, um, this was the question that we had about um, how can we improve what is decide on where is an optimal dosing point um, if we go into a fermentation reactor? So what, what would be an interesting uh, point to do that and where, where would it be located? And approach that we took there is that we would sampling the species concentration along representative stream as shown there. Um, then we would weight the data by a contact time, which would essentially mean the residence time in one of the uh, volume elements and then uh, get the probability distribution function of the concentrations. And this, in the end of the day, this gives us an idea how long or um, a, uh, let's say the, um, how, what would be the, or a mass, a point, a molecule that follows a streamline would say, okay, how long do I see a certain environment? And, um, if the uh, residence time would be long, yeah, then it would be I would be somewhere um, in a um, recirculation zone, for example. And even if the concentration would be low, um, it still can contribute to an overall uh, to the uh, to the overall um, um, overall umsatz um, uh, turnover um, at a at a higher level, and. Um, we can also say something about reaction conditions general, how homogeneous they are. Um, if I go to the ex, to the examples, how it looked like. So you could you could have two options for dosing points if you have a certain type of reactor. Um, so could um, introduce it in those two locations, for example, and can compare that to another base case. And what you can see then on this on on this distribution plots is um, okay, how much is it tailing? How fast are they reaching a homogeneous uh, or a full conversion in this case? So if the concentration is one, it would correlate to something like a full conversion and you would probably uh, have it as fast as possible. And you can see that on this overall curve, but what you could also then see a little bit more in detail is, especially in the tailing, if then people say, okay, is tailing is not very good and would negatively influence my product quality, then you would say, okay, it, it would be probably option A, what would reach uh, one fastest, so which would be the best in this, in this case, yeah. So by doing this, you could explore that. And uh, usually it's not that we do a fully optimized thing, yeah, that we have that many simulations uh, to, um, to come up with the best solution. But this post-processing step, of course, is fast uh, compared to uh, running a lot of CFD calculations if you say, okay, those streamlines are uh, massless, for example. Yeah. Okay, 
This would be one example where I would say a streamlined approach, also a very simple one, yeah, because this is time average flow field and everything, um, would give you an indication and help the colleagues to come up with a better solution. Um, another example is from the batteries materials, which is a precipitation step. So if you uh, produce materials or for batteries, usually you first uh, you do that in a stir tank reactor by precipitation. Um, we do simulations for that yeah, to give our colleagues an understanding what uh, can be expected uh, during that uh, or in the reactor itself, because you have different recipes. If you run different, um, let's say, battery materials, you probably don't want to all the time design a new reactor for everything. So usually bound to equipment. But you want to understand if I change the recipe, what can I, uh, what I have to look after or look for uh, that I get the desired product quality. So we are doing that by coupling. In this case, you really try to couple that uh, stir tank hydrodynamics and at least uh, the kinetics of the primary precipitation process. Um, then, if we use a streamline approach, we sample again the streamlines uh, at different dosing points, and if you see, they look. Uh, they are, stay very close together, especially at the first time of a precipitation step, which is important. Um, so to overcome that limitation, if you would only do that, you, you won't see that much. We do that for different rotor stator positions in this case, because this is then an important part. Yeah? This is also, if you say a limitation, in, again, because uh, we are not using um, a finite point approach, like lattice Boltzmann approach or something like that. Might be looking different then. And what what will come out of that? Um, I don't know. Can I move that away? I think that's better, right? Um, um, what we can read from that is um, we get now distributions of uh, two important uh, process um, rate or um, uh, parameter, I would say, like the nucleation rate, meaning how many nuclei are formed uh, in a certain volume uh, per time. And um, I see that, sorry, that's a wrong um, thing on the right. There's a gross rate. The second, um, the second uh, picture is the gross rate, not in seeds, um, um, for the already formed nuclei. So how much gets deposited on the already defamed, uh, formed nuclei of usually three different components. So battery materials usually have three different components uh, like nickel, cobalt, and manganese. They have different uh, tasks in one of uh, in these materials. Um, so it's important, uh, let's say the, the, uh, the mixture of those things is important, but also as I've seen on the right side, um, the, uh, the structure uh, that uh, is getting formed during this process of this material is important. And uh, by doing this approach, then what we can see is we get an idea on what the structure of such a material would look like under these process conditions. And in our case, we can say, okay, as the nucleation rate of the nickel component is very high compared to cobalt and manganese in this case, you will get then uh, nickel nuclei usually that form the core of every uh, larger particle or primary pa um, particle then. Um, then um, you would see then uh, a growth usually of all the three components in a similar rate. So that depends then usually on the uh, stoichiometric conditions of nickel, cobalt, and manganese, how it's built up. But you see then this is a manganese cobalt enriched shell, inner shell that you have. And as the manganese growth rate uh, falls off quite fast after some time, you would then have a nickel rich outer region in the thing. And by doing this analysis, so to speak, also, we know we are limited in our predictivity of that. At least, again, it gives a good indication how to control the morphology and um, how to build up hierarchical structures that people want to have in those kind of materials. Yeah. Yeah. Is therefore, I can say that streamlined approach and um, helps a lot in understanding um, how can we improve optimize reactor design, and even more so, what is even more important, uh, it's the process product relationships, because very often we are not designing new reactor all the time. We have to live with what we have, and therefore uh, this product, product, process product relationship is becoming more and more uh, important. Um, 
of course, we explore uh, these implications with a lot of simplification. So time average velocity field is definitely one. Uh, we usually only use indicators for chemical processes as shown. Yeah, we don't, uh, don't model everything that would be too expensive. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, we have distributions. What we usually don't look at so far is also population, uh, population uh, balance methods. So we, we don't necessarily look at uh, particle distributions all the time because this is also very time consuming to calculate. And therefore, as there's a lot of assumptions on the one hand side, and on the other hand, a lot, lot of need to better understand and use methods for this understanding, we are monitoring uh, the recent academic de developments, of course, with high interest as today. And again, therefore, thank you for the invite and giving me the chance also to listen to those inspiring talks. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a bit of time for 20 minutes or so for um, questions and comments. Maybe you should stop sharing. Yeah. Maybe that I, I start first, uh, uh, David. So uh, thanks a lot uh, once again for, for all the very interesting presentations. And uh, I'm uh, very happy that you indeed saw this huge uh, uh, band from the theory and the wonderful opportunities that we have uh, now to analyze uh, the, the, the Lagrangian coordinate structures. And we saw a lot of different uh, Lagrangian structures in, in different uh, applications at, at the end. Uh, and industry, the demand, and but what is possible uh, so far due to uh, time and cost restrictions, of course. So there's a very big uh, bandwidth and uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting from my uh, point of view. And uh, yeah, and on the other hand, you saw uh, George Haller uh, mentioned there are now these wonderful opportunities for quantify uh, transparent barrier barriers for uh, vorticity, for uh, momentum, for uh, uh, and for all these dynamic influences on the other hand, but how can we use this? We saw wonderful pictures from how this is, has been used in for, for nature phenomena, but how can we use this in chemical engineering? How can we use this in process engineering? This is a, a big question. What can, can tell us the barrier for vorticity, the barrier for momentum, the barrier uh, for, for these kind of dynamic processes in process engineering? Uh, Alexandra showed us some some first uh, trials to to use this quantitatively, for example, with these mixing structures. Yeah? And we try to find uh, the correlation between uh, mixing intensity and uh, the Lagrangian coherent structures. And uh, yeah, it, it, Veronique showed us uh, the, the, the they tried with these effective diversity to catch uh, the barriers that appear behind these uh, single single bubbles. And uh, yeah, and all these are um, um, unsteady processes. And we see in industry, mostly steady processes are taken into account so far because everything else is too cost uh, expensive. So that's what we have to do. We have now to bring this uh, somehow together, maybe to simplify the theory, uh, to make it uh, easier uh, applicable to industry. And on the other hand, uh, to have uh, yeah, stronger methods in, in industry, more power uh, computer methods, for example, um, yeah, to go to this in, into this direction. So there's uh, still a lot to do, I guess. But anyway, this may, may be just as an uh, as an, um, an introduction. But now we have a, an, a comment here in the lecture. I, I will read it. So it means, uh, "Hi, Arne. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Regarding the main limitations you mentioned about coupling computational methods at small feasible scales with much larger industrial scale reactors." Are you considering or exploring the possibility of coupling physics-based models with machine learning-based data-driven models in a more general hybrid approach? What has been done so far and how is industry facing the implementation of machine learning-based modeling on the near future in the field of scale-up <laughs> of uh, reacting multi-phase flows? That's a very, <laughs> very <laughs> complex question that I, I'm fearing I cannot answer that in uh, the sh short sentences. Um, but indeed, we are looking at opportunities. And um, I see uh, opportunities, especially in fields where we cannot really describe um, a certain KPI or, a, um, for example, product performance is something like that. Uh, what we can try to describe with uh, descriptive models, of course, 
is always measurable quantities like um, particle size distribution, you would say, even morphology to some extent. But we still don't know is is uh, is that now the the process uh, the product quality function? This is unknown usually in in most of the, uh, in most aspects, yeah. And um, therefore, it would be very attractive because you would need first to develop a quite complex model to describe that. And with data-driven models, um, I definitely see there um, an advantage of, of, of employing those things. Mm -hmm. If this was meant to do, of course, for the most part, um, we are we are using um, our classical approach, which I thought by some having some discussion is of course always a little bit of hybrid because every CFD model or any engineering model has a semi empirical correlations, which you can also say is, is a quite hybrid approach because these models are usually um, uh, based on experimental data and the fitting. So this yeah. is already data driven, if you like. And um, I think this approach we will always use. What we are aiming more is probably to have other kind of experiments that are more suited to the physics or chemi chemistry that we want to describe as the model. So instead of coming from an integral approach, rather rely, uh, um, let's say, take advantage of the fact that a simulation like a, a CFD simulation can provide a lot of uh, details of the dynamics and mixing and so forth itself. And you can really focus on the, on the uh, kinetics, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but then you have to make different experiments because then you have to make sure that these experiments don't include these effects like tr transport effects, heat transfer effects, and so forth. Yeah. Otherwise, it will, uh, will you will not succeed, but introduce the errors again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alexandra had a hand up before. Did you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have actually several questions that I was pointing down in the uh, during the other talks. And um, actually, my first question to uh, Professor Haller's talk was, um, okay, we have now this active barriers, but what we really need is the concentration, like the active reactive barrier. So um, for me, this would be very interesting if um, you you know that uh, anybody is working on this still, or have you been working on this? You said you have only for vector fields, active vector fields, but not for active scalars yet, uh, a theory. Um, and uh, I think this is something, um, yeah, which is very important. So is there anything <laughs> in the line? Oh, thanks for the question. Um, we were planning to work on reaction diffusion equations and other than just advection diffusion equations. And I think that's what you probably have in mind, right? Because the from my understanding of the context we're just discussing here that the, that you're trying to mix various substances, they are not active in my vocabulary. Uh, active would be the vorticity or the momentum or the linear momentum, but but some sort of substance which which does change um, in the, and it might react, but it's not intrinsically tied to a fundamental flow quantity, but it's rather carried by the flow. At least that's my understanding of reactive quantities. It could uh, be both, react right? It could also trigger some kind of movement in the hydrodynamic if the concentration gets then very high. I mean, so it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be passive in the kind of driving forces for the flow field. But yes, in the first regard, it could be. Passive, yeah. right, so, so, <laughs> so I, that would not be a problem in, as uh, I would have to know the exact form of the reactive term. I think we could add those to the advection diffusion formulation that we already have. And uh, that, that would still remain in the, in the passive realm if we just want to um, basically extend the diffusive theory by act, acting, adding reactive terms. Uh, the the active theory that I describe is is quite different. It's about vector fields, not scalars. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I mean maybe you and I could connect offline. Mm -hmm. Just to have a have a, or maybe with several of you, of course. I'm happy to connect with everybody, but to I, it would be helpful for me to see an actual. Uh, the PDE, the partial differential equation for an actual quantity that you would like to understand first, the mixing off, and then I could I could say what we could do with that. I already spoke to oceanographers who expressed an interest in doing that, but then 
for some reason we, we 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 didn't pursue that anymore but in oceanography you can imagine in geophysics mm -hmm. there's also an interest in acting reaction various species in the ocean algae yeah. and so on they are they are not purely diffusive but there are reactive processes there as well so definitely there are other areas in which that, mm -hmm. that question has been asked mm -hmm. I guess in chemical engineering, the interesting point is that you have very fast chemical reactions and very dynamic processes, and you directly see with a product at the end what's going on. So if there's an influence or not, and of course, you can be lucky if you're able to increase the quality and uh, the yield and selectivity of the product. And uh, this is, I guess, really the holy uh, grail of, of process engineering, if we would be right. able to do that huge, uh, huge point for, for facing climate change and sustainability. Yeah, but I guess, Veronique, you, you raised your hand, I guess. I have a lot of questions for everybody because uh, I'm not a specialist at all. Eh? Uh, but uh, first, maybe to Georges Allaire. Um, so uh, as far as I have understood, I think that uh, your, your method, your proposal is very interesting because it's objective. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, I'm not sure to understand clearly uh, what uh, brings the the notion of uh, of Lagrangian coherent structure and uh, the notion of uh, it's a barrier as compared, for example, but it's stupid question eh, uh, to recirculating flow. Uh, if I if I'm uh, look in the application we have seen, uh, we always. For me, I see recirculation and I say, okay, this is, this will be a barrier, but uh, maybe I have skipped something and please, if you can, uh, in a few words, uh, explain me. So if I understand correctly, you see that you're saying that if you already see that there's a recirculation zone in a flow, then what, what's the need for the for, for yeah, any further yeah, yeah. analysis? Right? Yeah, yeah, and in particular, because uh, this is at a given time, Okay, or in a in a small uh, interval of time, and then poof, it uh, it mixes. It's, it's not a, no longer a barrier. Uh, 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 it's because I have not understood eh, that I ask the question. I think the question you're asking is very very important. In steady flows, what you see is what you get. That's the short answer. Yeah. In unsteady flows, it can be far from being what you get. Uh, it's very easy to copy even just cook up two dimensional unsteady flows in which you would say, oh, I see a recirculation zone because the velocity field is pointing in directions instantaneously. It also changes in time, but hey, that's minor detail. And when you actually put in particles into that flow, they would run out to infinity. And you would say, yeah. how is that possible? Because my velocity field was always in this direction. So how right. possibly could a particle go that way? Mm -hmm. But the integrated effect of those small changes in the velocity field can very easily lead to an instability. The other way around, uh, okay. At any point, you might be seeing a stagnation point. Yeah. Okay, but in, in say, uh, wait, sorry, uh, just one second. So you would say, okay, that stagnation point is sort of rotating a little bit and moving. But hey, it's I'm not going to be looking for a recirculation zone there. It's not a vortex for sure because the instantaneous streamlines always tell me that it's a saddle. And you would be surprised that it can be just mm -hmm. the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the methods were born out of the desire precisely to make an objective assessment in advance rather than so that it's not just in the eye metric you have an impression, but you in fact have an exact statement. Is the okay. material confined to an okay. actual material recirculation zone or not? Okay, but uh, also for me, I think that uh, there is a danger when you compare, uh, okay, uh, experiments and uh, the theory, it's that uh, always the tracer, when you are in two-phase flow, always the tracers, etc., they have a different inertia as compared to the, the fluid. And this can lead to, to strong uh, deviations. Absolutely. And so, pff, yeah. um, I think that's chapter. I, I, I think we have to be very careful. Eh? Oh, yeah, but we've, right. we, we are not looking at this as right. of this week. Uh, but uh, people work... that want to use your method, yeah. they have uh, not to for, forget that. Eh? Right. So the this development, just to give you some idea, this this whole area has been developing for about twenty five years, 
And all the things you're raising, for instance, inertial particles, right. that has been also looked at 10 years ago. In fact, right. in the book, I referenced the whole chapter on how what you should need to do, what you would need to do when you're interested in inertial particle motions. Different right. things will happen when you have neutrally buoyant particles, different things when you have bubbles mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. heavy particles. So this mm -hmm. is a very well-developed field and these questions have been to a large and extent. very answered. complex field in uh, turbulence. Huh? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Alexandra, you have raised your hand. Yeah, uh, thank you, because it's, I think, just the right connection um, to the questions I have to Mr. Uh, Hoffman. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, well, because as the industry is looking still at streamlines of the mean field, and um, yeah, uh, theory keeps saying you shouldn't do this you should look at the other dynamical system which is time dependent and will give you maybe a completely different view um actually i i was wondering if you have at least for a small reactor already studied the differences in between the streamlines and the path lines so um, have you have some statistics on this? Or, or I mean, maybe you cannot do this on the full scale, but may, maybe you can do this on a small scale and kind of look what the difference is. So have you done this? Actually, I would have to ask my colleagues what, what they have tried and not to try it, so to speak. Um, of course, there are differences and limitations. I mean, this is for me, especially clear for the stir tanks. Yeah, and all these also I was mentioned before, what about the validity of the simple turbulence models that we have? Yeah, this is always a good question because I guess the mixing itself, which probably is the bigger effort, uh, looks different. Uh, if I look at coherent structures that use this transport, it's not only true to my understanding for those small droplets as we've seen in the experiments, but that's also true uh, for uh, larger vortices in these reactors. Yeah, they also transport concentrations against, or let's say differently as a, a gradient formulation would describe it. So of course there are lots of limitations in, 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 in those things, but um, I always have to come back to the point. It's still more than you know when you go with a very simple approach, or if you go with uh, correlations that you have um, out of, um, let's say experimental data for the thing, yeah. No, that's but, our that's yeah. that's that's the that's at least at the moment um, our understanding uh, to really say okay in stationary stationary that would also be an interesting part for me yeah how much value is in there if you shift to a different calculation approach yeah either an LES approach for example or if you go for lettuce Boltzmann approaches in 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 doing that yeah and if I just want to because we did it for the three liter reactor, which I showed, and I showed the FTLE fields from the instantaneous field. And here, this would be the forward FTLE field from the mean flow, where you would have a strong ridge here, and you would kind of, yeah, you know, describe a, a, a barrier to transport, which is not there, right? And it just appears in the mean field. And, and, and this is really important because you have here some very strong recirculating zones in the mean field, which don't exist in the instantaneous field, right? So it's just this one example, right? But it's, um, so it's, it, it's really, I think something which can make a difference in the statistics and the performance in the end. Okay, so I don't want to stop. Yeah, sharing. I mean, it would be, if you say a small, small tank, so usually we assume that they are ideally mixed. That's why you do that experiments to, let's say, come up with some kinetics in those kind of systems yeah, where you probably neglect it at all. I mean, this is the usual approach that people do is yes. they completely ignore it. And of course, would be interesting way to look into this topic and see, okay, are there limitations we don't see with the mean field or with the other way around and which ex really exists in reality and would somehow then um, somehow mask the results that you get of get out of your experiments mm -hmm. yeah because you would already have then again transport limitations in your kinetics and that would be not very good to apply it and later on you would further carry that error also on to the uh, large scale simulations mm -hmm. okay the last you. one george thank you just to follow up on that um I, I agree with Alexandra that, that perhaps to paraphrase what she's saying, that there are well-developed methods that have been now there for de decades that were 
developed precisely for unsteady flows. And uh, they were they were inspired by the inefficiency of these averaged uh, views on unsteady flows. I still remember 25 years ago, I was talking to people at United Technologies Research Center, and they were looking at time averaged flows and two-dimensional ones, which can show absolutely no mixing because the the stream you can nothing can you know cross the streamlines. And there were whole workshops dedicated to this. And we have now automated methods and packages that actually extract transport barriers, even for three-dimensional flows. So in my view, there's probably no need anymore to look at these ad hoc methods, because as you would, uh, Arne, agree, there's no particle that moves along the average streamline unless your flow is steady. And you're interested in material mixing, yet you're drawing a curve along which there's no material motion. If you're lucky and the so, so the the flow is highly symmetric, you still get some structures that's that's vaguely reminiscent of what you have in the flow. But you don't need to do this because the material actually doesn't move along that line, and there are well accepted and and uh, used methods in three dimensions and open source packages that actually compute material structures for you and material barriers, right? So that whole exercise is then seeing that, okay, I'm looking at a, a virtual object that doesn't quite exist. And on a case by case, I will relate that to actual structures and I will wonder how far or how close they are. That doesn't produce conclusions that will then apply to other flows because in some other flows, they will be vastly different even if they were close in, in what you're looking at. So I would just recommend and I would have, you know, I would, I think several of us would be happily following up with you on giving you links and, and literature for the kinds of methods that are out there and don't make these assumptions. I think it's quite, quite interesting. The, the problem might be that you need the full flow field, right? First, you need the full flow field before you can apply the, the, the methods. And I guess this is uh, first of all the, the big uh, challenge to get the flow field with a sufficient resolution. I uh, know actually now there are particle based methods now, single particle methods. So you can actually just have three particles and milk as much information as possible out of them. You don't necessarily have to, to be able to take gradients and so on. But in order for you to draw streamlines at any reasonable resolution, you must already have the, mm -hmm. the full flow field as well. That's why I'm hopeful that when I see attempts that draw at a large density of streamlines, that means that there is the access to the full. I mean, it's a CFD simulation, right? So you can just get as much as you want from that. Sure. I mean, I will follow up on you. That, that's why I said it was interesting talks there yeah, to see what is possible. And I think that's what we also mentioned. We would like to, ex to of course, uh, use, make use or most use of the data that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy, sorry, uh, David, but I'm very happy we have uh, get uh, just the financiation for a um, collaborative research center on smart reactors for the next uh, first four years, hopefully 12 years from the German Research Foundation. And we will have a lot of workshops with uh, students and uh, uh, and also summer schools and so on. And I would be very, very happy to invite you to this uh, to our events and maybe that we can follow up uh, on these events, uh, this nice discussion. Um, because I guess there's still a lot to do, and in this uh, smart reactor uh, collaborative research center, we will do this as well with numerical simulations and numeric and uh, experiments. So hopefully, you will bring us forward. And yeah, Alexandra, you have you have one. Do, do we have one, one last question? one? One last, last one. one. I also wanted to say um, another um, um, objective of this um, project in the uh, CRC and this collaborative research center is also to use sensors, which of course have inertia, right? They're big in comparison to the smallest flow scales, but um, there are methods. I wouldn't say they're like completely developed to be um yeah, easily applied to real world data, but there are methods um, that you can account for this inertia and still get maybe the mixing um, uh, barriers for the concentrate, like for the substrates, right? And so this is also another part. So you really put in sensors which know where they are, they kind of track their own trajectory. And if you have a handful of this, maybe by the newest techniques which emerge there, you can I mean, yeah, go back and see what the mixing patterns were. So maybe that's something which can be then used in large scale reactors. But of course that's a bit the future, right? <laughs> I guess, yeah. Okay. I think we might wind up now.
um, uh, numbers are starting to dwindle. So thank you all very much for a great set of presentations and a, you know really good discussions about clearly a vigorous area. Um, and it's nice to see this sort of combination of the range of disciplines and, and uh, stakeholders in this talk. And thank you very much again, Martine, and to Alexander and Michael for putting it all together. Thank you. <laughs> thank Thanks you. Lot. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Good bye -bye. contact. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye. bye. See you.